So if it's okay, sure, we'll start with Gina. Is that okay? Yes, good, yeah. Brilliant, okay, off you go. So my film's called A Fish Out of Water and it shows like an overview of a child, she's called Livy Fisher, of her life with pathological demand avoidance. So you can't really talk to her in the way you talk to a normal child and you have to be very specific on would you like to do this instead of saying can you do this and it's just showing how many people think that she's a naughty child or like she's just not being brought up right and it's the prejudices against her and it really goes into how she feels about it we interviewed the mother and we interviewed her separately and Livy just wants to be happy in her life and her mum sees it very much as She's her mum's very much she knows what other people think about Livy, whereas Livy feels about herself and what she I'm trying to describe it. And it's like how how she just cares about how she feels and she just wants to be happy and she doesn't really think about how other people see her, but she doesn't like her breakdowns or getting angry over small things that other kids wouldn't bat an eye at. Thank you. And as a focus for this film, then how did you settle on that, or what was what attracted to you to actually, you know, examine on this this particular story? So before filming this, I hadn't heard of pathological demand avoidance. It was so unheard of. So I was very much in the mindset of let's find out more about it and show more people about it, just to see what like trying to dig deeper into and bring an awareness to the um, disability. And what would be your aim, you know, for audiences um, to take away from the film? Is it very much like an educational piece to raise awareness about this particular, particular condition, if that's the right word? Yeah, it's definitely to raise awareness and to educate people as like I said, people don't know much about this. And it's very much to be like, not, not to judge a book by its cover. There's often, with unseen disabilities, there's a lot more going on that you don't know about. So to shout at, say, a child in public, which has happened to her before, it, you just shouldn't. You should just sit back and think, what are the repercussions and what's going on in her life? Thank you. And what particular challenges, if any, had you while making the film, just in relation to the shoot and, and things like that? Um, I'm sure you might have some challenges that you had to <laughs> had to yeah. work out along the way. So um, obviously the main challenge was that we didn't know Livy and it was how she would react around us not knowing anyone before. And we came in with like sound, cameras, all huge equipment pieces. And in the end, we found it, she really gelled with our editor who was on set for the day. Um, so basically we all went out for lunch and was like, give our editor the camera. And Livy then showed her around the bedroom. And But we, like, I wasn't allowed into her bedroom because she didn't gel with me. So that was a challenge. Our camera operator, Pat, giving up his camera to the editor being like, please go in her room. And... Um, we obviously had questions for the girl, but you can't tell her to answer them. So what we did is we also got her mum to help and her mum to sit behind the camera <laughs> and to ask questions that her and Livy would bond on. And I feel like that gave it a more personal touch. We had to work around a lot with her, but it worked out really well in the end. It did indeed. Thank you so much. Thank and you. that's the thing as well, you know, about developing rapports with the people that you are interviewing as part of a documentary so I'm sure maybe your editor never thought they were going to have to do that but no. <laughs> it just, no, it just so thought. happened they, they had a skill for that then um, yeah well that's great um thank you so much Gina and again congratulations on being shortlisted in in thank the category you. um thank you so over to Adrian then you're very welcome Adrian hi um, so yeah, I created a documentary called A Walk With My Dad and essentially it's like an observational, observational documentary um, and essentially what I really wanted to do was like um, sort of explore like my dad's background. Um, so he lives up in Ochnachloe, if you know where that is, like near Dungannon. I actually um, do indeed, yes. And quite yeah, a... it's lovely. 
How did um, you learn? Yeah. So basically, uh, growing up, I was never really close to my dad. And um, we never really sort of had much of a relationship. Um, so I sort of like wanted to sort of dive in and sort of figure out like, like do what was his child like? What was he sort of doing when he was younger? Um, and so growing up, he um, would often go to this lock called Creed Lock. Um, and honestly, I didn't really, starting off, I didn't really have much of an intention. I was just sort of um, shooting the sort of, shooting the lock. Um, and I was walking around and like talking to him. He was telling me like all these different stories of like what he did when he was younger and like, um, the sort of things he got up to and how he sort of grew up in that area. Um, that's just something that I sort of like really wanted to explore and be like, okay, actually, I could actually do something with this. Like, um, it's actually interesting and it's like sort of like building not a rapport, but like sort of understanding like where my dad came from and like sort of his struggles and what he did for uh, like living, like growing up. Um, so yeah, it's. It was interesting. It was, it was good. And thank you. And then as that collaboration between you, did you find overall that that was an enjoyable experience? You know, it's sometimes difficult working with family members in any shape or form. So Definitely. did you find that sort of as an extra challenge, but something, you know, overall that you enjoyed as a collaboration? Yeah, it was good. Um, I mean, I definitely was able to like find out more about my dad and sort of like, how we were very different. Um, and yeah, it was sort of really, it was challenging at first, I think, to like sort of understand where he was coming from and sort of talk about, there was a lot of stuff in that included or that I had that I didn't include in the final cut. Because um, for example, he got like very political at some point and we were sort of very different and sort of how he thinks not first how I think. Um, so yeah, that was definitely a sort of challenge to figure out like what I wanted to talk about. And then also we've talked at some point talk about like very personal content and so obviously there's like ethics in terms of there like whether there's stuff that because he's talking to me and I, i'm his son whether that'd be good for like a public audience and um, so, so obviously i sort of had like at the end of, i think i had like 20 maybe 30 minutes of audio and i cut, had to cut down to like maximum of five minutes um so yeah it was definitely a lot of sort of ethics I had to consider and like i think that's me and challenge being like i'm trying to exploit the relationship i have with them but being able to have enough content to sort of provide to the audience, you know. Well, that's excellent. And it sounded like you did strike um, a perfect balance there. Um, so yes, okay. that is commendable as well. And um, great to sort of, you know, produce a documentary on, on that relationship and sort of exploring that with your dad. Um, so thank you. Um, great. Okay. Um, thanks a million, Adrian. Over okay. to Jess Mills then. Hi Jess. Hello. Um, so my documentary is called Los Monos, which means the monkeys in Spanish. Um, and it was about the monkeys in Gibraltar, the Barbary macaques, who um, have come over from Morocco. They're the only free living monkeys in Europe. Um, and I went over there to Gibraltar um, in Easter last year and didn't really know what I wanted to do my film on. I go to the um, National Film and Television School and um, do science and natural history. So I was kind of trying to find a topic and saw the monkeys there, thought this would be great, and then saw how they were treated. And it was quite harsh to see um, people just not abiding by the rules. And, you know, they get, they get fed by tourists, but also um, tour guides as well. Um, and it's not good for their well-being. Um, and just physical health as well. So I went over again in the summer um, and did a bit more research and went around with a tour guide and saw properly the sort of comparison between um, how they live in the tourist areas, how the troops are there compared to the troops in the more natural areas. Um, and you could see like a massive difference in their behavior. Um, so yeah, it was sort of exploring that and exploring how, um, tourists treat them, sort of uncovering, getting it on film. Um, when I first went, actually, I, I just took my iPhone and filmed on my phone, thinking that, you know, the, the behaviour would stop if I took a big camera. Um, but actually, a couple of days in, I realised that even if I stood there with the camera, it was, you know, people didn't mind um, continuing to feed, even though it was technically illegal. Um, yeah. I don't know if I've explained that very well. <laughs> yes, that is explained really well. And 
Jess, tell us then about that as a as a topic and a subject matter. Like, what um, attracted to you to that in the first place, or how did you sort of come about? You know, this actual issue. Yeah, I I'm really interested in conservation and just our treatment of the planet um, in general, and I think just seeing it firsthand and seeing that everyone else was fine with it, it really interested me how how we are at tourist attractions um, just generally and why people think that's okay, whether it's sort of conforming to what other people are doing. Um, you know, the monkeys are wild animals, they're not pets, but people were treating them or trying to treat them like they'd treat their dog or something. Um, and I just wondered why people thought that was okay to do. Yeah, and I wanted to sort of spread awareness of that as well. And is documentary a genre that you are particularly interested in going forward or was it just for this particular film? Um, no, definitely. My course is, um, it's directing and producing science and natural history, um, which is, you know, it's, it's pretty niche and it's, I want to continue making films about conservation. Um, I'm making a film at the moment in my second year about fashion and the environment. So I want to continue sort of exploring our impact on the environment in many ways hopefully like fashion is something that I'm really interested in so hopefully that's something I can continue doing sort of documentaries around that area yeah. super so we can look out for that film for next year's competition uh, <laughs> um brilliant thank you so much that's great to hear about the background um the background thanks a million Jess um then over to Jess or other Jess here <laughs> you're very welcome Hi. Hi guys, um, so the film I did with my friend Abby um, is called um, Diversity in Fashion, Time for Change, so it's focusing on fashion. Um, and um, my friend Abby is, um, she's disabled, she is um, visually impaired and um, she's a huge, huge fashionista. So it was her kind of passion to uh, make a film about like the fashion industry and like how it caters or doesn't cater to disabled clients. Um, and so that the film pretty much of the film and kind of takes us through her experiences of how she kind of um, purchases clothes and how she kind of gets her fashion fixed while still being um, visually impaired. Um, and then we also reached out to a, um, a charity called Models of Diversity and they represent, um, um, you know, disabled models basically. So um, it could be amputees, it could be um, those visual you know, visually impaired, um, could be those with um, some kind of you know, psychological condition um, and, you know, get them basically into the industry and get the modelling. So we interviewed uh, the founder of um, that charity as well as a couple of models from there. Um, and then also we uh, interviewed a, um, a, a lifestyle blogger um, called Sassy Wyatt, who's also a um, guard, um, Guardian journalist, I think, from what I remember. Um, and she's very into fashion too. And we got her opinion on a couple of things. Um, so, yeah, it's very short. Uh, film but that's kind of the gist of it and it's just to um, yeah it's just to kind of make the point that we believe that um, you know diversity of fashion is more than race and um, sexuality and, and body image it's also um, people that are just able to so yeah excellent well that's great and no better platform than film to get you know to get that message across mm -hmm. um, so well done yeah. and, and thanks for taking the time to enter the competition and, and sort of, you know, this was a topic that um, stood out and definitely one that w has a powerful message for, for audiences. Mm. Um, brilliant. Okay. Thanks, Jess. Um, mm -hmm. Hi, Peter. You're very welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Hi. Thanks for having me. No problem. So the arts in quarantine, tell us a little bit about that then and um, the inspiration. Um, of course. Sure. So uh, there's a, a research project called uh, Arts for Reconciliation that I do video work for. And it's like a research project all about uh, sort of investigating how um, the arts can contribute to uh, peace building uh, between different communities. And uh, they uh, just when, just when uh, you know, COVID sort of hit and when the, the lockdown first began, they were eager to uh, sort of commission a film that would be all about uh, how this affects the arts industry in ways that people may, maybe like wouldn't have, uh, have, have actually thought about unless they were directly involved in it. Uh, so the film is um, quite simple. It's just me uh, filming 
sort of my own surroundings and uh, what was directly accessible to me at the time, I guess. Uh, and just talking about um, parts of the art sector that uh, I noticed were, um, you know, how, how, like I noticed were responding in interesting ways to uh, the quarantine. And I also sort of like uh, brought in like elements of like, uh, like my grandparents and stuff and how um, it had sort of changed the way that they had viewed the arts because it became something that was very, uh, you know, suddenly uh, the arts industry, when everyone's sitting at home with nothing to do, becomes uh, a lifeline because um, because uh, it's 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 the only way really to pass the day when you're stuck inside. So yeah, that's, great, that that. great. And how long then did the shoot take? Like how long did from start to finish? Were you working on it? Um, I'd say uh, most of the time was me just like uh, writing down like different thoughts and uh, just trying to trim the because it was it was me just talking from uh, a sort of you know pre-planned uh, a list of things that I knew I wanted to, to talk about already. So I guess it's sort of like semi-scripted in that sense. And then uh, I just spent um, about five days just. Uh, taking a bunch of video from uh, from inside my home and from places that uh, I still had access to because th this was back in, in the height of lockdown where like the only time you were allowed to leave the house was to go on like exercise trips and you weren't allowed to see anyone when you did them. So uh, it was uh, it was back in, a, in, in like the sort of uh, the time in lockdown where um, you had to be really interesting or you, you sorry, you had to be really interesting. You had to be really um, inventive in how you uh, got material, I guess, like like um, just because you weren't allowed to leave the house, you know, regardless, so. That's true. Well, that is testament to you and anyone else whose film was actually filmed in lockdown in terms of being more inventive and creative and, um, you know, finding solutions to problems. So thank you. Um, that's great, Peter, to hear about that. And well done again on being shortlisted. Thank you. So Harry, last but not least, um, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining us. So yeah, fire away. Tell us about your film, its name, and a little bit about it for audiences to, to hear about. Um, so it's a documentary. Uh, the title is Men of the Dust. And so it actually started off as my final year thesis project in college. Uh, so I'm a film student as well. Um, and basically I've known about for a while, uh, this guy down the road from my parents back home who, uh, is a stone carver and he does like these amazing life-size sculptures entirely by hand, like these really intricate things. Um, so it, it kind of started off as something really simple. Uh, I just wanted to document, uh, him and, and, and his, his works because like I'm into artwork and illustration and things like that myself. Um, and then it started getting a lot more interesting than I expected, to be honest, because like I found out he's one of only like 10 people left in the country who still does that kind of craft entirely by hand. Like he doesn't use any technology. So then I started realizing that like there are a lot of kind of, kind of like what Jess was saying about conservationism, except this is kind of like conservation of craft instead of uh, a creature. So it, it kind of became really interesting then asking about like, his dying craft and where it's going and um and then i also found out like he creates a lot of um memorial pieces for um people like who have just lost loved ones so he actually deals with a lot of a lot of grief and in, in his everyday job which is something i never anticipated so it became a lot more um kind of deep and, and introspective than i expected um and when I was when I was shooting, um, the person who he was working on a piece for at the time was actually his neighbor, who uh, I then found out was like his Buddhist teacher. And so like this whole story unfolded and it, the final product was not what I expected to be at all. But I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. And isn't it amazing how documentary allows that, you know, like you're able to uncover yeah. stories and, you know, you know, extend what your original vision maybe was for, yeah. for, the, for the project. 
Um, that is fantastic. That's great. And was yours filmed over the last six months or before lockdown? Yeah, so I started uh, shooting at the end of January and I finished uh, about like three days before the lockdown started in Ireland. So I kind of dodged a bullet there. Um, then I was editing at home during lockdown on my dad's computer, which was like slow as hell. So that was really <laughs> stressful. Like, there were points when I didn't think this documentary was going to exist. Uh, so I was just delighted to have a final cut by the end of like April. Um, so yeah, it was, it was definitely a product of the pandemic. <laughs> exactly, no, that's great. And I suppose very much a, a time stamp as well and off its time yeah. you know, going forward when you're you know, able then to sort of think back about um, this, this year and everything. So, I mean, anybody can answer this, but are you continuing now at the moment to make other films? I know you did mention Jess about another idea but are you getting back into idea development or being able to shoot shorts again? Is that to me sorry? Or... Well just any of you just in terms of like what, <laughs> how you find now like the world of filmmaking and what you're working on and do you sort of feel you can get back into it or is are things still on pause a little bit? It's definitely a lot more challenging I'm finding right now. Um, yeah, like trying to, trying to get a small crew together, trying to get equipment, um, like even, even getting people for an interview at the moment is quite difficult with like, you know, you have to follow regulations and, you know, like socially distanced interviews, like they're not the easiest. Um, but again, like, like, like it was previously mentioned, you know, like it does give you an opportunity to be more ingenuitive, you know, to be more creative. So, I guess you just have to take the positives from it, really. Well, that's it. And as I was saying just at the very start, we at Cinemagic are embracing the, the virtual platform um, and seeing it as a positive in a way because we want to be able to showcase these films now to as wide an audience as possible. And perhaps the films will reach, you know, new and different audiences in this format. So um, as well as that, we still very much wanted to provide just a chance like this today for you to hear about or hear from other filmmakers and what types of films are being made and I suppose the, the challenges and, and things like that um, over the last year or so with, with production. Um, well, certainly the last, the last nine months. So um, we will very much be promoting your films now um, over the next couple of weeks in terms of the showcase um, screening. And we'd love for you, you know, to let as many people as possible know that they can access the films and we hope that you have you know have time to to watch a few of the other categories and, and packages as well because the standard of the short films that has been submitted is very very high and we really want to commend everybody who is shortlisted um especially with the trying times over the last while and it is just very heartening for us at cinemagic to see um films being made so well by young people and the diversity, I suppose, of the stories being told as well. And we're very much about giving a platform to new talent and to stories, you know, about all walks of life. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.